today my topic is describing pictures a pictorial view of studying language i welcome all of you to this program the description of pictures is not a value neutral activity that is the basic assumption on which this program rests that these are culture guided activities that ultimately culture will play a role in how we describe a picture therefore this idea that uh, a description of a picture is independent of the culture that we come from is a fallacy i mean it's a wrong view of language the rules of grammar must serve the larger goals of what the culture demands of language users so ultimately that is important that culture will determine how language users actually participate in the act of using language in the act of describing a picture it it will not be otherwise and grammatical correctness does not automatically imply the cultural acceptance of a certain statement definitely does not you know and my favorite example is always the joke how we use jokes in different contexts the same joke that i may make with a friend will not apply to a parent for example will not apply to a teacher for example and the jokes that i make with my teachers or with my parents my friends might not think them very funny you know so ultimately it is about the cultural acceptance becomes important to the statement and not merely uh, gram producing grammatically correct sentences in themselves they might have no value at all second thing is that that language is not a system in itself independent of social and cultural factors this is uh, reflective of the earlier statement i made you know, about a language being guided by culture you know. so this so called system of language is actually a cultural process more than a system it's dynamic by its very nature and not static what makes it dynamic is that language is constantly in a state of evolution so in the process of describing a picture we think of the best possible ways the language can be used to arrive at such a description this view goes against the systemic view of language as being independent of the community of users this is the baseline that i'll use to make my argument about describing pictures and a pictorial view of studying language what is a picture is it a word or a picture of a word when you describe a picture is it still a picture or is it a string of words put together are we using words to talk about pictures constructed in the mind or are the pictures independent of the words we use to describe them basically it's a question that cannot be resolved you know. but what we can say is that when i think of a picture what is it that comes to my mind a word or a picture these are however circular arguments without any resolution in view whether you imagine a word or a picture it is still an image that appears in the mind a picture therefore is a combination of a word and an image and can be defined in one phrase as word image what i am trying to do in this program is that to discuss a couple of views on how to describe pictures the most important is the systemic view that language is a system we use to understand reality and another is the mental view of language that somehow language represents thoughts of course the third view is the more formal view of language language is our understanding of grammar that it is through grammar that we arrive at some sense of language but the view that the philosopher ludwig wittgenstein takes is a completely different one to all the three views of language that i just described to you he takes the view that language is a tool language is merely a technique language is merely something that assists you to talk about reality but of course it raises larger questions to you know is there a reality at all you know that is a question also that comes to mind this program is an analysis of the processes involved in the description of pictures 
and to what extent these descriptions are a faithful reflection of the object we have in mind. In addition, can we say that all descriptions are constructions of objects based on certain perception of the viewer. In other words, are descriptions based on how and what we feel and think about an object in our own individual and unique way. So, what I am trying to do is raise a few questions regarding what descriptions of pictures is all about. It may seem like a very simple thing on the surface, you know, but it is not. You know, there is a deeper cultural process involved in that description. The last but not least important question is how can a deeper understanding of the pictorial view, the view that pictures are word images, throw light on the study of a language. These are the issues that we will be discussing in the next few modules. A picture is a model of reality. This is a statement from Wittgenstein's book, in fact his first book, Tractus Logicus Philosophicus. And in that he says that a picture is a model of reality. I use that as a subtitle of this particular module. A model is a representation of an object. How we represent an object is what a model is all about. For example, a model apartment has the salient features of an apartment irrespective of how different other apartments might be. So, we have a model apartment which will choose all the features of what an apartment is like. You know. How does a picture become a model of reality? That is what the question is all about. This is one of his earlier views of language, which is supposedly distinct from his later views of language. However, I think that there is some connection between Wittgenstein's early views on language, where he says that a picture is a model of reality, and his later views on language, where he views as language as being culturally relativistic in more ways than one. For example, you know, I would like to visualize an angel. You know. I mean, I have not seen an angel in my life, and I don't know what angels look like. But I have seen people who have angelic features or who have an angelic look. So, I have seen children with the faces of angels. So, I mean most babies tend to have this kind of a pure look, innocent look that we associate with the adjective angelic. So, what I can do is I can select features of what constitutes angelic. I mean I can take different qualities from different people and collect them and define what angelic means from my point of view. Thus, the features are fragments more than anything else. What we term as reality is selective in a certain sense. We select details and create a model out of those countless details by piecing them together as we do in a jigsaw puzzle. So, it is like a puzzle, you know, that is what Wittgenstein keeps emphasizing. It. it is not something that happens naturally. We are constantly selecting and we are arranging words like a puzzle, you know in order to describe a picture. It is not a spontaneous activity. The language is not spontaneous. At the same time, it is not merely an imitation. The child is not merely imitating the adult when he or she learns uh, language. What you can say, it is a creative imitation. Of course, you know, if it is creative, it cannot be an imitation. Therefore, it is a creative kind of a interpretation of what the adult is doing or of what the community of users is doing. So, each child creatively relearns the language. That is what makes more sense you know, than just saying that the child is blindly imitating what the adults are doing. You know. It is not that simple. You know. It is not that mechanical anyway. You know. It is a creative reinterpretation, creative process of relearning. So, if I had to create a model angel, that is exactly what I would do. I would select details of faces from a database created in my unconscious. So, whether I have seen a movie or whether I read a story or whether I came across a person who I thought was, who I thought had an innocent face, whatever you know, along those lines, I create this perfect angel in my head. You know, you see? The most important thing while learning a language is to create models of reality. You know. 
we constantly have to create these models of reality. You ask a child or a second language learner to imagine an object. That is why imagination is important in language learning. And that's why we need to be creative while learning a language. Once the language learner knows that he or she has to select details from reality, they become active and creative participants in the process of language learning. No language is possible where there are no pictures. Pictures don't emerge from a vacuum. That's my fundamental point, you see. They require that the learner is able to construct one in his or her mind out of the details gathered from reality. And again, you know, I'll keep repeating this as a sort of refrain, that that reality which we talk about is social and cultural in nature. It is society and culture that will teach us you know, what that reality is all about. But we cannot know that reality except in a partial way and only through language. The language of pictures. When we talk of the language of pictures, we are talking about word images. That is, a word results in a picture in our mind of what it describes. For example, a soft brown sweet square may be evoked by the word chocolate. Language by definition is a system of word images. In emphasizing the role of pictures, the pictorial view of studying language emphasizes the fact that communication is the essence of language learning rather than grammar in the purest sense of the term. This is a view that is more or less accepted by now. That more important than grammar is communication. While we constantly say that, the fact is, I mean, in reality, we keep uh, harping on the role of grammar rather than seeing that language is more than what just grammar is all about. For example, you know, I mean, in case there is a fire, we say run fire. You know. I mean, I wouldn't think of framing a grammatically correct sentence. It doesn't make sense you know, to the situation. Therefore, what Wittgenstein says in philosophical investigations is that to understand a sentence means to understand a language. To understand a language means to have mastered a technique. These are his words. You know. So language is about technique or what we call strategy and not merely about constructing the sentences in a correct manner. You see, we have to constantly keep that in mind. Once we accept the view that to understand a language implies mastering a technique, it follows that technique primarily involves the making of pictures or word images to make a point. Look, when we think of pictures, we are, it doesn't mean something that is visual. Because then the question arises, what about visually challenged uh, men and women? You know, how do they construct a picture? But they are constructing a picture. There's no doubt about that. It is just that their sense of what a picture is all about might vary from yours. But it doesn't mean there are no pictures involved. You know. There are word images involved, even there. So therefore, what is at stake here is what kind of technique we use you know, to create that particular picture. What is that frame of reference, that shared human behavior? I mean, that is what is important here. You know. Because what Wittgenstein says is that shared human behavior is a system of reference by means of which we interpret an unknown language. So while making the picture, I should keep in mind the shared behavior that makes it possible for the other person to comprehend the picture. So my sense of what a picture is might differ from the other person's sense of what a picture is. Most studies have shown that people who are visually challenged, when they were given sight, you know, they actually said that they had a different person, in different face in mind. It's not the same face. But that is true even of so-called normal people. When we don't meet a person over a period of time, you see, the picture we have in mind before we meet the person is a completely different one from what we encounter in that meeting. Therefore, what is important is we should concentrate on what is the shared human behavior, which becomes a system of reference. That's what is important. The shared human behavior is a cultural database that enables us to communicate with one another as human beings who exist as part of a group and not just as individuals. One more thing that Wittgenstein effectively challenges is the view that language 
is an individual activity. The, he says that there is nothing like that. You know, it can never be that. Ultimately, language is a collective experience. The role of the individual will merely be one of creatively experimenting with, with an existing cultural database. So all that you can do as an individual is creatively relearn or creatively reuse words. However, what you will not escape is the demand that you have to invent pictures, you have to constantly create pictures to make your point. To create a picture, therefore, is not only to master a technique, but also to be aware of the cultural base that enables one to use language in the first place. So what Wittgenstein says, it's a technique. You know. How best am I able to technically arrive at a sentence that can express a certain private emotion? This is what Wittgenstein is trying to say. The language of pictures is about understanding the tools we use to describe the pictures. Can we separate the language of pictures from the language of description? The answer is a clear no. That one cannot be separated from the other. Both are intertwined in some sense. Both are two sides of the same coin. For heuristic purposes or for the purpose of exploration, we make this distinction. But it's not a real distinction in that sense. While actually using a language, this distinction is more or less a meaningless one. So when we think of a language, we must bear in mind that all we intend to do is to make our point clear. So the ultimate goal of language is clarity in its philosophical sense. You know. So at any point, our use of language is about attaining clarity. How often we use the statement that I am not understood or you don't understand me. Understanding is, I mean, central to our use of language, I mean, to the way we use language. Constantly we use this word. In a day we use it so many times. Because the point is we expect some kind of clarity from the other person. And likewise, we have to be clear to the other person. Therefore, descriptions assist a language user to achieve that kind of clarity. Uh, this is what Wittgenstein says, I'm quoting him. What we call descriptions are instruments for particular uses. Think of a machine drawing, a cross section and elevation with measurements which an engineer has before him. Thinking of a description as a word picture of the facts as something misleading about it. One tends to think only of such pictures as hang on our walls, which seem simply to depict how a thing looks, what it is like. These pictures are, as it were, idle. So descriptions are about usefulness. It's not like the picture on the wall, you know, you see, which is just there, lifeless. Is it useful or not? We have to think of a machine drawing. That's what he says. You know. So how useful is the description in making my point? in clarifying my point. Take examples, you know, very simple examples like when I say I have a headache or when I say I'm ill. How best do I describe, you know, this situation of my being ill or me having a headache or even more private situations like being in love, you know, for example. Are these really clear, you know? Because so many times we assume based on a certain misreading of gestures, for example, that this is what is already communicated to the other person. But the reality is that it is not. You know. It's only an assumption made on one side. You know. Therefore, the description assists in achieving that goal of clarity. There is nothing like something that is intrinsic. You know. I mean, when you look at me, there is nothing that tells you that I'm ill. Of course, unless there are visible manifestations. But nothing can tell you that I have a severe headache at this point in time. It's not possible for you to know it. It's an illusion to assume that you must know how ill I am, or you must know how bad I feel, or you must know how deeply I'm in love. You know, these things are not possible. These are external. These are rooted in a specific use of language. Therefore, we need to use language. Therefore, we need descriptions. We need to create pictures 
to enable the other person to know that language is independent of everything that goes by the name of a language most words have random meanings unlike uh, onomatopoeic words such as the buzz of the bee or the hiss of a snake if i have to imagine the word language i am actually imagining absolutely nothing the word in itself says nothing you know but i have to know what that word means you know i have to know those parameters with which we describe this word you know that's when description becomes an intelligent assistant it helps me to tell you what language means a description is a word picture but not of facts in themselves the reason is that facts are constantly changing something that i liked 10 years ago probably i don't like it anymore because i have changed the word pictures are not static entities they are related to the situation in which we use the descriptions the word picture is not without a context it is a context that is vital to appreciate what the word picture is all about language cannot exist without a context and this is what wittgenstein says you know that language is a labyrinth of paths you approach from one side and know your way about you approach the same place from another side and no longer know your way about but while this may seem simple and obvious that contexts are important it is very hard for us to actually accept it in reality because so much of language is personal take an in insult for example i mean we never say that an insult is has something to do with the context or abuse for example however it might be true you know it might be a certain context in which the insult or the abuse is produced so it's very difficult for us to not take it personally there is always this element of personally attaching ourselves to the word you know, or to the words but what wittgenstein says that that it's meaningless to attach the person with the word it's absolutely meaningless it doesn't make sense because language is outside you it's not connected to your inner self in any way there is no connection between your inner self and the words that you use if you're looking for an essence or if you're trying to discover an inner meaning to the word you are actually end up arriving at nothing because words in themselves are meaningless it is the context that gives them the meaning it is from the context that this word uh, actually becomes what it is that is the thing about describing pictures you know that when we describe pictures we must understand you know, that these are relative to a large extent on a situation that we cannot try to look for a deeper meaning than what is obvious because that so called deeper meaning is only another set of words or another set of word images so it goes on and on endlessly so to look this whole view that language is a system this whole view that language is a mental construct or a mental reality this whole view that language is formal or a grammatical construct all three of them are problematic in that sense because they are not respecting the context the context is important for us to understand what a word means and the context is important because it dissociates us from investing too much in a word so at that point we realize you know there is a distance you know, created by the context between the word and the person they are not connected there is no intrinsic connection there is no logical connection it's purely an assumed one or an imagined one that you must bear in mind there is a problem with this statement also you know, that does that imply that everything is contextual that ultimately the way i use language is only relative therefore that all misunderstandings can be eliminated by describing in that picture perfect way so if i find the right picture or if i find the right word image in mind you know does that mean i am able to solve all problems related to language 
and the answer is of course no you know, it does not happen so simply in reality but an awareness that we should not or we cannot personalize language an awareness that there was language before me and that there is language after me will free us from most of those confusions from most of that artificial or imagined attachment to words it will make you realize actually that the context is important while uh, producing word images I'll begin the conclusion with a quote from Wittgenstein from his book Philosophical Investigations. This is what he says, open quote. It is a misunderstanding to say the picture of pain enters into the language game with the word pain. Pain in the imagination is not a picture and it is not replaceable in the language game by anything that we would call a picture. Imagined pain certainly enters into the language game in a sense only not as a picture what is in the imagination is not a picture but a picture can correspond to it ultimately wittgenstein is trying to make the point that there is nothing in the imagination so see the point that he is making what is in the imagination is not a picture but a picture can correspond to it so you cannot look for a picture in the imagination a word image is not to be found in the imagination but you can invent a picture that comes closest to it so when i tell you that i have a headache you know what comes to your mind is absolutely nothing in fact but correspondingly you'll create a picture that will give you an idea of what it means to have a headache so as a man i don't know how painful giving birth to a baby can be i learn it through what i have been told over a period of time that birthing is a painful process you know i still don't know it but i have learnt enough to actually be able to appreciate the painful part in birthing you know so i'll combine a headache and a stomach ache and many other aches together and probably say you know birthing must be this difficult or this horrible you know, or this painful so unless i do that i cannot arrive at the statement you know that i know what it is like because in itself the knowing means nothing you, know, you, you cannot know as such it is always secondary in that sense it's a secondary statement therefore wittgenstein says lying is a language game that needs to be learned like any other so these things we learn them you know. i learn through a headache through the pain that comes with a headache i can learn what other kinds of physical problems might be statements such as you are the soul of my soul which are common in certain languages are plain exaggerations they are expressions that are learnt and to be used in situations for example the arabs are very fond of exaggerations very fond of hyperboles they like to speak in hyperbolic language either way while the arabs love to exaggerate the english love to understate so the arabs are overstating and the english are understating you know either way the description of a picture happens within a cultural context we don't mean to say that the arabs don't know how to speak or that the english are speaking wrongly it it's not true either way it's not true in the absence of the context it is impossible to imagine making a point at all so to make a point we have to understand the context therefore a pictorial view of studying a language is a way of understanding the contexts in which meanings come into existence the basic point i'm trying to make is that meanings are not natural they are contextual therefore they are social in character and they emerge from a certain political and economic situation 